Thank you. How are you all? Uh, Thank you for that warm welcome. I really appreciate it. I thought we could just start this morning with a word of prayer, yeah? What a better way to start. So let's just, I just ask as you sit there this morning, just open your hands and open your hearts with me as we just open ourselves to the Lord and what he wants to speak and impart into us this morning. Lord Jesus, we come as we are this morning, willing, available, open to your transforming power at at work in, in our lives. And so God, we ask, Lord, this morning, Lord, as you've been working, as you've been shaping us all the way through this morning, even before we even walked into this space, God, I pray, Lord, that in this moment, in this treasured, sacred moment, Lord, I pray that you use me, that you lead me, Lord, that my words be your words. Lord, I pray that you empty me of myself, and Lord, that you fill me afresh with your Holy Spirit. Anoint the words that come out of my mouth, and Lord, I pray for every person who hears my voice. Lord, I pray that they be transformed a step closer into your image and your likeness. God, all we want is you, and this is all for your glory, and we promise to give you all the glory. And everyone who agrees with that said, Amen. 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 Fantastic. Well, last weekend was Easter. I definitely enjoyed the long weekend. Tell me I'm not alone. Um, I enjoyed eating extra chocolate. I enjoyed eating hot cross buns, probably too many. Who else ate too many as I look around the room? I'm in good company. I'm, I'm amongst friends this morning, which is fantastic. Um, But, you know, as I was um, sitting, as we reflect on Easter and the significance of Easter and as much as those chocolates and those hot cross buns and those sleepings, if you don't have children, as much as they were beautiful and bliss and sacred, um, we reflected on the fact that our Jesus Christ gave his life for us on the cross, that his death and resurrection means that we have life in him each and every day, don't we? And the fact that he bridges the gap between us and our heavenly father. Because the father loved us so much that he gave. He gave, he gave his one and only son for us, didn't he? And as I sat in my personal space with Jesus um, around Easter and as I was reflecting on the significance of Easter and what it means for me personally, I couldn't help but get past the cross. I couldn't get help but get past the significance of what the cross means for me today and what the cross means for all of humanity since the thousands of years ago when Jesus went to that cross, died and rose again. I couldn't help but start to reflect on, on the journey that Jesus willingly did for us, the fact that God sent his one and only son, the fact that Jesus willingly rode on the back of a donkey towards Jerusalem, knowing, knowing very well the suffering and the pain that he was about to experience, the fact that Jesus willingly washed the feet of his disciples and broke bread with them, which we get to celebrate through communion each time we gather, the fact that Jesus... Um, you know, he, he sacrificially washed those disciples' feet, but he also, he also willingly took on the weight of sin and death as he took on the weight of the cross, a cross that's meant for sinners. And what I love about the cross is the fact that the story didn't finish there, did it? The story did not finish there. He rose again, and then he sends his disciples and, and the Holy Spirit, and this, this is how we get to live our lives today, and this is what the cross means for us. Our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, through the work of the cross, sends us into the world. Our God is a missionary God. Can I get an Amen. You agree with that? Our God is a missionary God. God has always been involved in the world, always initiating, always directing mission in order to redeem and to restore it. And as Christians, we're called to join God in his mission, to participate in mission each and every day. And what a privilege it is. I don't know about you, but that humbles me. The fact that God of the universe would choose me in the midst of all of my brokenness and flaws and failures to be part of his redemptive plan here on earth. That's incredible. And what the, the, what the beautiful thing is, is that we actually see this threaded, you know, the fact that God is a missionary God, we can see this threaded all the way through scripture, can't we? As we read the Bible, right from the creation account, right through to Revelation. In Genesis 1, we see God creating the world and declaring it good. 
You don't have to wait till the New Testament to understand that our God is ascending God. We see God sending in the very first page of the Bible. I mean, the very, the very act of creation is God sending himself into the world. In the, fa- the fact that there was great chaos in the world and that, that God, with no other need beyond himself, would actually send himself into the chaos to create order. And you see this beautiful notion of him sending his word out as we read in, in Genesis 1, where we see um, you know, God, you know, and God said, and God said, all the way through the creation account, here it is up on the screen, and God said, let there be light, and God said, and God said, water in the sky, and God said, let, the light, let, let there be lights in the sky, and God said, and God said. His words go out like a sent one, doesn't it? And creates order, he creates order in the cosmos. And then we have this beautiful picture of him creating humankind. And how does he indicate his special relationship with humankind over and above all the other, all the other um, you know, creatures on earth? He sends his ruach, which is the Greek word for his breath. He sends his ruach into us as human beings. He, he, he creates human beings in his image and his spirit inhabits all of humankind. He sends out his breath into us and then he sends us with the task of caring for it and caring for earth and all that's in it. And this shows us that God is concerned about the world and that he desires to see each and every part of the created and all of creation flourish, to thrive And then we go forward, fast forward a little bit to the book of Exodus, don't we? Where we see God rescuing the Israelites from slavery in Egypt and leading them towards the promised land. And even when humankind sins and disobeys and falls short of what God has asked, even though humankind breaks that that covenant with God, God sends them out in punishment. But what we find is this beautiful thing that all the way throughout the history of Israel, God is both the sent and the sending God pursuing humankind all the way along. He enters into the tabernacle then, doesn't he? He sends his presence to appear in the holy of holies in the temple. And his his word goes forth through the prophets and, and through the kings And there's this constant sense of which the God of the Old Testament is the one who pursues and extends himself into all of humankind. This shows us that our God is not only concerned about a a physical world, but is also concerned about the spiritual well-being of his people. I mean, it would be enough to say right there and then, wouldn't it, that our God is a sent and ascending God. But we're new covenant people, aren't we? What Jesus did on the cross is is what creates a new covenant with with our God and with us. And so it reaches this crescendo moment in the New Testament where God sends his one and only son for us. We see Jesus coming to earth as a missionary. He proclaims the kingdom of God to heal the sick and to offer forgiveness for all. And what we read in in Luke 4, Jesus quotes the prophet Isaiah where he says to them, um, proclaim the good news to the the poor, where he comes and he says to proclaim freedom to the prisoners, the recovery of sight to the blind, where where Jesus comes to set the oppressed free. This, this, This reminds us that God's mission is holistic. It's about spiritual um, redemption, but also physical redemption. And he's all about restoring. And this is remarkable, isn't it, in and of itself. But then we discover that God God, God the Son and God the Father sends the Holy Spirit. God the Father and God the Son sends the Holy Spirit. So that we discover that in and through the Trinity, the triune God, the very core of who they are, is the fact that they actually send each other. God the Father, God the Son sends the Holy Spirit. The triune God is a sending God. They send each other. And you know, often theologians will hear them talk about the Trinity and they'll say, the Trinity love one another. You would have heard this before. They're in community. They're in unity. They're one these are all things that the, that, the Trini- that the Trinity is, and all of that's true. But I think actually the closest thing that the Bible gets to explaining what the three persons of the Trinity do for each other is the fact that they actually send one another. 
And that cycle is not complete until we, until we realise that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit sends us. That Jesus is able to say to his disciples, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Jesus sends his disciples to continue his mission. And in Matthew 28, we, we see Jesus say to the disciples, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. This shows us that our God is not limited to a particular location or a particular demographic or a particular tribe or a particular tongue. Our God is a sent God and sends us into all the nations. And then we fast forward to the book of Revelation, don't we? There we see a vision of a new heaven and a new earth. And John describes a city, a new Jerusalem coming down from from heaven. And the city is described as this place of um, beauty and holiness where God dwells with his people. And throughout the Bible, we're shown that God's mission is not only about rescuing individuals, but also about redeeming and restoring all of creation. And we can see these biblical examples and others that, that, God, that God's missional nature is actually littered all the way through the scriptures. His mission is deeply rooted in his love for all people. And that involves bringing salvation and healing and restoration to the world through Jesus Christ. God is not passive. He is alive. That is what the cross teaches us. Our God is a living and acting and breathing and moving God and he invites each and every one of us to join him in the spaces and the places and people's lives where he is at work. What an incredible privilege we have. So if you want to mirror the character and the nature and the work of God in this world... If you want to be a true disciple and a true reflection and an ambassador of Jesus Christ, it does include being loving and just and merciful and good and true and all of those things, but at its very core, it actually actually includes us extending ourselves beyond ourselves for the sake of others because that's exactly who our God is. He is a sent and ascending God, and we are the sent people of God. It's the very cross, isn't it, that Jesus hung on, that we discover what it actually looks like and what it means for us as sent ones. Our motivation for mission is not simply in the fact that there is need, because as we look in the world around us, there's so much need, isn't there? But that's not our motivation for mission. That's not the only motivation. Our motivation is in the fact that we are called to mirror who our God is, the character and the nature of our God. So if you believe that God is both a sent and ascending God, and in order to mirror the character and the nature of our God, the triune God, that we are to be the sent people of God, then I think the next really key question that we need to sit on, and we're going to sit in this this morning, is to whom have I been sent? All of a sudden, the mission of God becomes very personal, doesn't it? Because when you think about it, it's impossible to be a a mature follower of Jesus Christ if if you do not see yourself being compelled beyond yourself to the cause of others. One of the great mistakes that I think a lot of Christians make is that they believe that they were sent to the church. And often I hear leaders sometimes say, well, I've been sent to serve the church. And I understand why many people get there, don't get me wrong, because they have often come from somewhere else or they feel that that God has sent them to a specific place and a specific community of faith. And sometimes their thinking is, well, we've been sent to serve one another and we are expected to serve one another. And our pastors in some ways, our ministers can sometimes be sent to a certain particular community of faith. But don't let that muddy and confuse this simple thing. You cannot be sent to yourself. If we are the church, we're not sent to ourselves. We're not sent to each other. We're meant to serve one another and to be a community of faith. 
But when we use the word the words sent, we're using it in a very particular way. We're talking about the church extending beyond itself. So every church should be able to answer, to whom have we, as a collective, been sent to? So we, want, we might say, we've been sent to the people of the north. We've been sent to the people, all those that are in the north of the city. Or we've been sent to all of, our, all of the indigenous Australians that, mix, that, that live, live amongst us. Every church should be able to identify to whom they have been sent. And the bigger the church, perhaps the more people that they would feel sent to. But let me personalise this. If the church should be able to say to whom have we been sent then so should you. Every single one of us should be able to articulate to whom have I been sent. And rather than the people of the north or, you know, people of the north of the city or the people in my workplace or the people in my school or the people, you know, at my coffee shop that I frequent, um, instead of those sorts of things, more specifically, can you, can you actually name those people? Can you actually tell me who those people are? Can you actually tell me a little bit about those people? Let me tell you a really quick story about a guy by the name of Gotti Essas. He's a liberation theologian and he came to Australia to speak at a conference. And he was at this conference and he's, he's a really um, beautiful human being. He's got a real heart for the poor and the marginalised. And he gets to this conference and it's f- the room's filled with people. And he says to them straight out, he says, so I hear that you have been sent to the poor. That's great. That's wonderful. But what are their names? Who are the poor that you have been sent to? What are the names of the individual that you serve and that you extend beyond yourself for? Who are they? Can you tell me their names? And there's this like deathly silence in the room. Because they were sent to the poor, but I think in some ways, even just saying that, it's so abstract, isn't it? And it can actually never really fully get earthed in a lot of ways. So if you are sent to the poor, what are the names of those poor people that you are sent to serve? What are the names of those in your neighbourhood, in your street, that you have been strategically positioned and placed amongst? What are the names of your workmates or your uni or the, the people in your, your class or your, 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 um, your gym that you are sent to? What are, the, what are their names? Tell me. Introduce them to me. I want to get to know them. If you can't do that, then I think we need to just reevaluate who we are actually sent to. If we're seeking to mirror the character and the nature of the sent and the sending God, if Jesus can clearly articulate to whom I have been sent by saying, I have been sent and I'm sending these disciples, then so should we. We should be able to answer that same question, to whom have you been sent? So I've got a quick activity that I want to do with everybody. You would have received one of these on the way in. And this is what I call a relational map. If you want to pull that out, if you haven't got that, would you mind just raising your hand or if you haven't got a working pen, just raise your hand. I've got some incredible helpers here that will help us out. Just keep your hand raised nice and high until they come and see you. Just keep it nice and high. Thank you so much, helpers. So I want you just to have a look at this with me for a moment. And the house in the middle, if you're doing your neighbourhood, that's your house. And then you've got three houses across the street from you most likely, three houses behind you, one on either side. What I want you to first of all is just pick a primary. Where do you have the strongest sense of sentness from the spirit? Circle one. Is it where you live? Is it where you work? Is it where you study or play? Just circle one of them. Then the second thing I want you to do is fill in the names in the boxes. Who are the people in your relational world that you daily, weekly, monthly connect with? And then the next one I want you to do is describe those people to me. Write it down. Write down some key words that describe that person around their name. And then then I want you to describe the place. In the margin around the box, around the outside of the box, list the key words that describe your neighbourhood or your network of relationships. And then the the second last step is, 
is write down some, or do some, draw a little light bulb next to some of those people, or a little asterisk if that's easier, where you see an openness and an invitation, where you see someone that, that's willing to hear what you have to say and, and where you want to actually continue to invest relationship in and you just sense there's a friendship there. And the last thing is I want you to breathe and bless. Can I have the BLESS acronym up on the screen? What would BLESS look like in a relationship with them? For those of you that don't know, this is the acronym of BLESS. Begin in prayer, listen, eat, serve, share your story. I just want you to record some ideas about what it might look like for you to bless them on the back of the page. And what we're going to do right now is the media team are just going to play some soft music and I want you to spend some time filling this out. You're not going to be able to fill it all out for those of you that are perfectionists and like to feel like you've completed a job. You won't get to do that in this space. I won't give you that much time. But I just want you to start it at least. So can we just take a few moments? Thanks so much, team. As you're starting to finish up those thoughts and write them down. Um, is it okay, Ben and, and Sam, if we make these available for our life group leaders during the week? So if you didn't get one, I'm sure we've got a few extra printouts. If you want to take some for your life group and do this as an activity in your life group this week, that would be a great thing to do. But I want to say this. I want to say that if you, if you filled this out or if you struggled to fill this out, I'm not doing this to shame anyone. I'm not doing this to point out the fact that you might not have people on your relational map yet, but perhaps the next step for you in your journey is to discover where God is working and whose life around you that God is actually working in, and for you to simply join God in those people's lives, for you to discover who it is that God is actually sending you to, yeah? And can I just say this? <laughs> this is not... A, a method or a tool that we use in order to recruit people to our church services and to expand our reach as a community of faith. Our goal as sent ones is to take the word, the spirit, the breath, the reign of God into our community and to be able to identify who they are, to meet them and to greet them. So I'm hoping that if you struggled filling this out, I'm hoping that Hopefully I'll get an invite back here and I'll be able to come and hang out with you guys again. And when I do, I'm hoping that you will have this filled out, front and back, and that God would have really revealed to you some wonderful things and ways in which he, he's using you in people's lives. Amen? Very cool. Well, I think once we come to terms with the fact that we are this idea that we are sent and that we are on mission and that we're meant to be missional, and then we find ourselves in this space, I guess, of asking a pretty logical next question, and that would be, what is the mission? What are we meant to do? It's great that we're sent to people but who, and find out who we are actually sent to, but what is the mission of God that God is actually asking us to do? And in that regard, I want to say that the best definition I think I've heard of the mission of God is actually found through a guy by the name of David Bosch, who's a South African theologian. It's going to come up here on the screen. He says this, The mission of God's people is to alert everyone everywhere to the universal reign of God through Christ. Let me say that again. The mission of God's people is to alert everyone everywhere to the universal reign of God through Christ. This is much more expansive and organic and rich and much more biblical than just thinking our mission is to recruit people to church, which in some ways some people have actually reduced it to. Some people have reduced it right down to meeting people, befriend them, invite them to church. And I don't have an issue with you inviting people to an event or a service or a gathering that the church holds. The church is an incredible resource for us in people's journey with Jesus. I'm not saying that that's bad. But what I'm saying is that if that, that is all that mission has become, that is a significantly reduced um, form or method or outcome of what the universal reign of God th through Jesus Christ looks like, isn't it? If you think that mission is just social work with a cross on it, then I don't think that you've fully got it either. Not suggesting that mission doesn't include serving the poor and alleviating suffering in, in some ways, but I think that if, if it becomes these things... At, 
and only these things, then it's a really reduced understanding of, of mission and our mission in the broader context, isn't it? So going back to that definition, the mission of God's people is to alert everyone, everywhere, to the universal reign of God through Christ. This means that that mission is deeply founded in the belief of the king and his kingdom unfolding here on earth. Day in, day out, he is unfolding his kingdom right before our very eyes. He is redeeming and he is restoring the earth as we go and this, this, you know, to be a missional person is to be a kingdom person. You cannot separate the two. The two are one of the same. You can't be one without the other. They're intricately linked. But the mission of God's people is to tell and to show people our God reigns. That is our mission. Wherever we are, whatever home you have been positioned in, whatever workplace you have the, the privilege of serving within, Whatever gym you go to, whatever coffee club, whatever uni, whatever school that you go to, God has strategically placed you amongst that people group to alert people to the universal reign of God through Christ. So if you're not sure whether God reigns or if Jesus is king, and if you're not sure about whether his kingdom is stoppable throughout the world and throughout history, then you'll probably have difficulty, I think, getting along and getting on board with the whole missional theme. Because missional people believe that God is at work. He is living and active throughout the world. And that God is actually leading history towards the end that he had in mind at the very beginning. Mission is not thinking, oh no, we stuffed up, we blew it, and God going, oh no, what am I going to do now? I've got a plan B, I'll send Jesus Christ. Jesus was not plan B. Jesus was intended from the very beginning. Jesus was part of God's plan all the way along. History is moving exactly where God intends for it to be. Now, it's hard for us to believe that, isn't it, sometimes, because there is so much suffering and pain and brokenness in our world. But I am convinced of the fact that our God is sovereign, our God is king, and he is ruler over the world. And my job, even though it is difficult sometimes to understand everything about his will and his sovereignty, my job is to let other people know in my neighbourhood and in those places and spaces all around me that the reign of God is unwavering and just and about reconciliation. His reign is about wholeness and being reconciled to the Father and the Father to us. To do the mission of God in this world by work and by deed is to, is to give people a taste and a sense of what the coming reign of God will look like in all of its fullness. So it takes it beyond, hey, come to my church, it's better than any other church in the neighbourhood, doesn't it? And it takes it beyond, share, let's share a meal, let's share you know, some soup at a soup kitchen that I serve at. It takes it beyond both of those things. It is both of those things, but it's so much more. It's about community development and community engagement. It's about bringing justice to the city. It's about sharing your story, the story of God, and how God is redeeming and restoring your life, and how God is working in and through your life. It's about caring and giving and serving, and it's about so much more. It means that we show people and alert people to the fact that our God is king and his kingdom is coming. You should be involved and get on board because one day when God's kingdom comes in all of its fullness, we need to be ready for the magnificent experience of being at one with the triune God. So one of the best ways I've found to help understand the way of alerting people to the universal reign of God is one that I've heard Mike Frost actually use. It's a bit of a story, a bit of a picture analogy. And so I want you just to imagine for a moment that you are in a broken, old, abandoned, derelict house. In fact, close your eyes with me for a moment. All across this room, just close your eyes. So you're in a derelict, abandoned old house. It's filthy, 
Homeless people have been living there. It's been graffitied on. It's dirty. It's an old, broken house. Imagine yourself locked in one of those rooms in the house. I know it gets a bit weird, but just hang in there with me. The mattress has been set on fire. The room is covered in soot and filth and grime, and it stinks. It's pitch black. You can't see any, really much, but you do, you do manage to see that there's just one window. I want you to imagine that this window is completely covered in soot and grime and filth. With your eyes closed, I want you to imagine that right on the other side of that window right now is the most magnificent sunrise happening. The sun is like bursting forth from the horizon. The sky is turning blue, it's moving to colours of purple and red and orange and yellow. Life is just bursting over that horizon and it's literally the most breathtaking sunrise that you have ever seen. How much of that sunrise do you think will actually be visible in this disgusting room? Keep your eyes closed. There will probably only be one of the faintest of glimmers of light through that grime-covered window. Now I want you to imagine yourself in that room with someone who has never seen a sunrise before. I know it's a bit imaginary, but stay with me. With your eyes still shut, how would you go about explaining that, that faint glow that you see each morning around this particular time? I mean, you could say, hey, have you ever wondered what that glow is? And, well, that's actually the sunrise. You could attempt to describe it like what I just did, but at some point your words will start to fail you. At some point, you'll just say, here, let me show you. But how are you going to show them? Assuming that you can't smash the window, you'd probably try and clean the window, wouldn't you? But let's be honest, the, the, the window is covered with soot and grime and filth. So you're not really wiping it clear, you're basically just sort of smearing the dirt. So you're just creating a little bit more of a sense of being able to see through this window. OK, you can open your eyes. I love this image, not because I ever desire to be locked in a dark room, <laughs> but I love this image because it creates a really accurate picture of what the mission of God's room is like, of what it, what it, what it means and what it looks like for us to be in darkness with other people. We've seen the sunrise. It's been revealed to us through the Holy Spirit. Jesus has described it and he has articulated and helped us to understand it through the scriptures, hasn't he? But we're in this room with people who have never seen it and they just don't understand it. So if we take the sunrise as a representation of, of God's reign and the reign of God just bursting forth, and if we're in this dark room and you'd say to someone, well, eventually you'd start to sort of say, well, the reign of God is like this or like that. You try and sort of explain what the reign of God looks like. You try, try and sort of just describe it to them. You'd probably say something like, you know, King Jesus has come to deal with our sins and our flaws and our failures and King Jesus has taught us a whole new way of living and is inviting us to an, into a new relationship with him, with God the Father through the Son, empowered by the Holy Spirit to bring about justice and reconciliation and wholeness and to bring healing to our world. This is the sunrise bursting forth. But eventually we'll probably start stumbling on our words, wouldn't we? I don't think we have enough words to describe the beauty and the majesty of our God and his kingdom. So we'll probably just say, here, let me show you. Let me show you the works of justice that God's people are committed to. Let me show you how we're reconciling God um, to, to others. Let me show you how we're reconciling fathers to son, how we're reconciling um, so, you know, husbands to wives. Let me show you how we're reconciling Jew to Gentile, how, we, how we're reconciling slave to free. Let me, let me show you how we're reconciling black to white. This is the sunrise. This is life. Look at how we're bringing about justice and peace and wholeness in the world. This is us demonstrating as well as explaining what the reign of God looks like. And really, when we think about it, smashing the window sounds like a really good idea, doesn't it? 
But at some point, Jesus will come in all of his fullness and all of his glory, in all of his majesty, and that window won't just be smashed out, it'll be completely blown out of the frame. And we, along with every other person on this earth, will get to see our God in all of his fullness, in all of his majesty, and then we will see and know how amazing our God really is. But that's not our work. I wish it was my work. That's not our work. Our work is just simply to smear the dirt, to make the picture a little bit more clearer for people, for people to get a little bit more of a sense of it, because like I said, one day Christ will reveal it totally and completely. So if we go back to our definition before, the mission of God's people is to alert everyone, everywhere, to the universal reign of God through Christ. The core question for all missional Christians is to ask, what does the reign of God through Christ look like in my neighbourhood? What does the reign of God through Christ look like in my school, in my university, in my workplace, in the spaces and places and in the people's lives he has gifted me with? You know, often... If, we, if, if the kingdom of God has come and if God's world, God's, God's redeeming plan is overlapping with this broken world that we live in, how can you alert people to it? Often we don't know the answer to these questions unless we spend time listening to the Holy Spirit, listening to those in our context. You know, many of you will be familiar with the blessed missional rhythms, but let me just um, show them to you again up on the screen. So the first, these are just missional rhythms. These are not a tick list. This is not a to-do list for you to do each and every day. This is just a rhythm that you follow with the Holy Spirit. The first thing is begin in prayer. This is where we have the opportunity to listen to God and to say, hey God, where are you working? Whose life is your work, are you working in? And how can I join you at work? Give me opportunities. Show me your ways. Show me where you're working. And that's what it means when we say begin in prayer. The L stands for listen, and this is where we have the opportunity to listen to the Holy Spirit, but also listen to others. One of the best ways that we can listen to others is learn to ask good questions. Take an interest in their world. Our job is not to come up with with the answers for others. Our, Our job is just to simply listen, to understand their needs to understand how God is working and then to simply join him in those spaces. I want to invite the band to come up. Thanks, Matt. Then the E stands for eat. This is where we get to share in the vulnerable act of eating with one another. Jesus did this wherever he went, didn't he? He ate with people. He shared meals and broke bread with people. Then we get to the first S, which is serve. And this is where we get to find ways to intentionally serve people in a meaningful and a personal way. Now, random acts of kindness are fantastic, but part of the missional rhythm of of serving is learning to serve the other person really well. And often that will come out of a space of listening to them really well. The final S is share your story. As you do all of these things, as you begin in prayer, as you listen, as you eat, as you serve, you'll get the opportunity to be able to share your story, to be able to smear the dirt a little bit more, to be able to give them a little bit more of a glimmer of what the king and the kingdom looks like. You get the opportunity to be able to just share what God is doing in your life and what Jesus means to you. You get to say to people who who perhaps you encounter that might be feeling really anxious, really worried, really fearful. You might get to say to people, hey, look, through my relationship with Jesus, I've experienced a peace that transcends all understanding. And that is the peace that guards my heart and my mind because I have a relationship with the Prince of Peace himself. That's what a story might look like for you. Maybe it's something else but we get this beautiful opportunity to be able to share our story. What a beautiful gift that you could be to someone through simply sharing with them what Jesus means to you and how the cross of Jesus Christ has shaped your mission. The cross 
which, which represents suffering, Jesus turns into a symbol of, of redemption, of restoration. The cross, which is a symbol of suffering and, 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 and you know, pain and heartache, he turns into that, that redemptive, restoring storyline that we get to share the story of. The symbol of, of the cross, which is a symbol of death, Jesus has turned into a symbol of life to the full and promises fulfilled. The cross of Jesus Christ has turned the, the, a symbol that, is, that symbolises bloodshed into a symbol of selfless love of our Jesus Christ that has been poured out for you and for me and for all of humanity. This is what the, the shape of mission looks like because of what Jesus has done on the cross. Our God is a missionary God and He invites you and me to be part of it. Will you stand with me for a moment? I want you just to take a moment right now and I want you to hold the names of those people that you wrote down on that relational map. I want you to hold them in your heart and in your mind or in your hands as well if you want to. And if you don't have people's names on that relational map just yet, we're gonna pray into that as well. So let's pray together for these people by name, shall we? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we just take a moment just to be still and to know that you are God, that you are working all things together for good and that we have hope because of who you are. God, you know each person on our relational map, you know them by name, Lord, you know every hair on their head. You know their struggles, their fears, their doubts. You know their insecurities. You know everything about them. So Holy Spirit, will you help us to be really good listeners, to be able to hear the ways in which you're working, to be able to hear the needs of the people. And Lord, for us to be able to be effective ambassadors for you, represent, rep, representatives of you here on earth. Lord, I pray, Father, that you can help us without hesitation to share your goodness and your grace and your mercy at work in our lives, how you can share, how, how we can share that with other people. God, will you help us to do that? God, I pray for boldness. I pray for courage. Lord, I pray for people to step out of their comfort zone, following your lead and your light wherever you lead them, God. Lord, I just ask, God, that you just show us your way, that you lead us. God, help us, Lord, to be intentional and meaningful in the way that we interact with these precious people. And God, for those of us that don't yet have our relational map filled, or maybe we've got no names on it at the moment, God, I pray, Lord, that you open our eyes to see the ways in which you're working all around us and the people's lives that you are working in. God, we, we lay everything down at your feet in complete surrender in this moment. And Lord, we ask that you lead us, that you guide us and that you send us. We are available. We will make ourselves available for your kingdom cause here on earth. So Lord, teach us and show us, we pray, in every single way. We remain humble and available in, to everything that you want us to do. In Jesus' name.